Good morning. My name is Mike, and it is a privilege to be the pastor of this church and to see your face today. I hope you're enjoying yourself and enjoying what God is going to do in your life. Whether you're watching online or if you're here in person, it's a great day to have you here. If you're a guest, would you do me a favor and take out your phone and just scan these little guys. They're all over the building. Just scan this. Let us know you're here. Or if you want, if you got a bulletin, just tear this off. Put that in the offering plate later on, and that'll let us know you were here. If you're watching online, just uh, send us an email. We are in a new series uh, right now called Stories. It is the third time we've done this. It's such a great opportunity for us to get to know each other and uh, be able to see that God takes our mess and turns it into a message. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy the opportunity of seeing what God's doing in people's lives, but also be thinking about maybe sharing your story. It is a great chance for you to see what God's doing uh, in and through this church, but also what he wants to do through your life. God bless you. You've been checking us out. You've been visiting our church for a while. Maybe you've been here uh, just a week or two, maybe a month, maybe longer than that. And uh, you're just not quite sure if this is the place for you. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to decide that for sure. We're going to have a starting point, a meeting at my house coming up real soon. And I hope that you will join us. It's an opportunity for you to come and to get to know me and me to get to know you. You can ask any questions you may have. And I have an opportunity to share the vision of our church and the direction of our church, where we're headed. And I hope you'll join us. Um, please sign up uh, as soon as you possibly can so we know how many are going to going to be there. Uh, my staff will join us after uh, we're finished and they'll join us with food. And so that's another reason we need you to sign up because they're going to show up with vittles and we get to eat together as well. So I hope you'll join us for this great opportunity to get to know each other and for you to decide whether or not this church is for you. I hope it is. And you'll join us coming up. God bless you. <clears throat> Hello. So very soon for that new members class is tonight. Um, so if you're interested in coming, please sign up today so we know. Um, we'd love to have you. Uh, that'd be great. I want to share something I read um, last night. Um, Steve and Sandy have a travel um, blog that they're doing, and they are in Rome right now, or were when they wrote this. And I just want to read this. Uh, it's just neat. Um, but they were at the Basilica of St. Peter, and he wrote this. He says, the, the sheer size is really hard uh, to place uh, in words. No video or picture can do it justice. The ceilings go up forever, and the statues that adorn each column are beyond any colossal statue I've ever seen. Sandy was very emotional when she took in the beauty of it all. But what I wanted to see with my own eyes, I wasn't sure if that was possible. We made our way through this whole complex, resting along the way as, we're, as we were worn out from our journey there. I stumbled upon an open staircase, and a few others were going down into it, so I followed. Down the stairs I went until I was under the altar above, and in front of me was the tomb of Peter. Behind the portrait of Jesus and underneath lies Peter's tomb. Is he really there? I'm not sure. But in faith, it brings me that much closer to someone who gave everything for the cause of Christ. Peter willingly gave his life like that of his friend and master, but he chose to be crucified upside down so as not to take any glory from Jesus, and by being crucified in, in the same way. And I just read that, and I thought, man, that is something. He's on, as you know, um, most of you know, sabbatical uh, from our church. Uh, Melissa is um, leading our worship for the next month, and we appreciate uh, Melissa, but be praying for them as they're traveling um, and enjoying the sights, getting the rest they need. But uh, what a privilege to be a part of uh, Christian history and uh, sharing Christ still uh, with uh, the same kind of conviction. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. We're going to invite the men, if, the boys, if you'd like to come pray uh, here with me, uh, that'd be awesome. I also want to ask you to get your heart prepared. We're going to have the Lord's Supper uh, together in a little bit. Melissa will 
uh, instruct us um, in that. So um, thank you for being here. Awesome. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this day and for who you are. Just for the chance, God, to worship you and to know you. And um, thank you, God, for um, testimonies from Scripture, from history, from people who um, died for their faith, died for the truth. Um, Help us to live for the truth in our life, to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just thank you, God, for these guys, and I ask you to bless them, take care of them. I pray uh, for Melissa today, and she leads us, that we would be drawn into your presence and that we would encounter you. So we prepare our hearts uh, for the um, Lord's Supper as we have communion together, as we commemorate the, the body that was broken, the blood that was pierced for our sins. That brings us forgiveness, and reconciliation, and also is a proclamation of a death that brings life to whoever accepts it. May we live that out in every way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll worship. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see everybody this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning. I need you all to sing loud. I'm on the tail end of a head cold. So please sing loud so we can all praise the Lord together. Communion Sunday is Victory Sunday. We declare the victory of our Savior. And so I'm excited to worship together today. Let's lift our voices. There's nothing that our God can't do.
glad God never gets tired nor grows weary of us. Let me tell you what happened at 4 a.m. this morning. Mom, mom, 4 a.m. What? What? My radio won't turn on. I said, child, you go back to bed right now for your own safety and for my sanity. I am so glad that God doesn't do that to us, right? 4 a.m., Lord, my heart's hurting again. Shush and go back to sleep. You know, he doesn't do that with us. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful he doesn't respond the way that my human flesh wants to respond. Um, I, I, my child did leave to see this morning, by the way. He's fine. But just in, in knowing Father's heart for us and the things that he does for us that we don't even see, that he is there in the, in the dark hours. God works the night shift. And we... In our perspective, in our hurts, and our struggles, sometimes I know that we forget to see the evidence all around us. You're going to kind of hear a theme as this is going on. It's like, there's nothing you can't do. God, I see the evidence. There is a victory in you. You're going to do this again. And it, um, Communion Sunday is a great day to declare that together. So let's go ahead. We're going to sing about the evidence all around us that God has been faithful and that he has been good. i 
evidence is here. Peter might still be in his grave. Our Lord is not. Isn't that so good? Oh, we've come to the um, time today. We're going to talk about offering and communion. It's such a wonderful Sunday when, um, when communion comes around. I love the remembrance because we need that. Um, Ties, we're so thankful for the generosity of this church, and it's such a unique way that we get to worship God. There's several ways that you can give. They're on the screen by um, in the bucket, bill pay online by text message in person or by mail. Um, if you need any help with all of that, I know that people are av- av- available to help with it. Um, this Sunday, ah, come on communion, doesn't it make you happy that we get to take part in the Lord's Supper? One of the, the longest running traditions I think the world has ever seen, and we get to take part of it. As we, um, the elements are right here on either side of the table. We ask that you come around to this side, take your elements, come back to your seat as we're worshiping together, and then please hold them. We are going to take them together as a congregation. I love the victory that communion declares. It's when we talk about the table before the presence of our enemies. I am eating in front of my enemies going, yep, he won. And it's to look at the things that are in front of us saying, my God has won. My Savior has triumphed. No matter what is happening, he has, he has prevailed. I'm so thankful for Communion Sunday. So we'll be singing this song together, and then Pastor Mike will come up and take us through communion with one another. If I could have the, the ushers come forward to help serve the elements. When you feel led, please come around and then return to your seats, and we'll take the elements together. fails it won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph my God will never fail my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle
You may be seated. The Apostle Paul wrote this from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he broke it, said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Scripture says, For whenever we eat this bread, drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Cannot wait for that day.
Thank you that you have given us your son. Thank you that we can celebrate you today. God, I pray an anointing on your word this morning. Give Mike the words to speak. Open our hearts to your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Maybe see him. This is my story. I was in Winter Park with my family, and we were staying at a condo there. And I had a teen and a preteen and uh, a little guy, six or seven years old, and I wanted to go hiking. And of course, the teen and the preteen did not want to go hiking. So dad stayed at the condo with him, and uh, yeah, my youngest son, John, and I started on this hike, and we were going to hike up um, it was summertime to the ski area and then I was going to call my husband on my cell phone and he was going to come pick us up because it was quite a long hike for a little guy. So the hike was beautiful, we hiked along, we got to the ski area, we were both tired um, and this was uh, over 20 years ago. Um, cell phones didn't work so well back then. I know that's difficult to believe, but I tried to call him and I got no service. So we were brainstorming what we were going to do and we decided that um, the quickest way to get back to where we were was to walk on the railroad track because it went right by our condo from the ski area. So we started walking along and, and we're both tired and he's especially tired. and. Um, I'm trying to entertain him and uh, what, what game can we play along the way? And he said, well, let's play I Spy with my little eye. Well, the problem with this is there's a railroad track and then there's a forest on this side and there's a forest on that side. So we spied a lot of green things um, and brown wood. That's all there was to spy. And we finally walk into town and we're both really tired now and I see this road and so we walk down this road and um, we are again walking into wilderness. There's nothing on this road. So we stopped and we prayed and I said, you know, God, we're lost and like we really need some help here. Um, and this road, there was nobody on this road. There was no cars on this road. It was like out in the country, middle of nowhere road. And then this car comes and stops. And it was a sedan. And the people in the car said, can we help you? And I said, yeah, we're looking for a condo. And uh, we're lost and we can't find it. And they said, well, get in. We know where it is. We'll take you to it. So we get in this car. And I um, don't really remember much about the people in the car. There was a woman, young woman driving. She had shoulder length light hair and the guy on the passenger seat had um, curly dark hair. And um, it kind of looked like a hippie mobile, but they had a cross hanging from the mirror and they were playing Christian music and I felt totally comfortable and so um, we drive along and I said where are you going and they said oh we're going to the Angel Lodge and I said okay so they drive us to our condo and we get out thank you goodbye and then I go inside and um, pick up a phone book and because 20 years ago we had phone books and I look for Angel Lodge, and there is no Angel Lodge in Winter Park. And so then I started asking people around the town, is there an Angel Lodge? No, there is no Angel Lodge. But I kind of already knew when they picked us up that they were angels, that God had sent a divine appointment for them to come and find us because we were lost and we were tired and we needed somebody to come and help us. And so that's the time we met angels unaware. Apologize, uh, Linda Klein, her name got cut off there at the beginning. She's right over there, hello Linda. 
Um, appreciate your story. Um, awesome. Can you imagine um, finding out when you get back? Um, never heard of the place, um, but God has, and God knows our address. Um, uh, any of you ever had an encounter um, that you think was an angelic one, where you felt like um, you met an angel. Uh, this morning's message is about angels and their appointed activity in their in our lives. Uh, we, you know, talk a lot about the devil. Um, churches talk a lot about him. We talk a lot about him. He's he's uh, um, kind of gets a lot of press um, in culture um, too. Um, but we don't talk enough about angels. Um, we talk a lot about the devil and what he's up to, but very little about angels and what they do. The Bible is not silent on the subject. Uh, when you add it up, there's about 300 specific instances in Scripture, references to angels in the Bible. But if you add the times where um, groups of angels are mentioned, like um, you'll read heavenly hosts or a great multitude or angel armies, you can add another 200 references uh, to that, uh, to angels in the Bible. They do more than sing. Um, They fight. They do more than serve. Uh, they protect. From Genesis to the book of Revelation, angels are mentioned. Uh, you can hardly turn a page in Scripture without hearing the flutter of an angel's wings. There, there are stories um, in the Bible where they're mentioned. But um, I'll be honest, even I, when I've looked at them, uh, have really skipped their activity. Uh, a couple instances, for instance, like when in the onset of Jesus' ministry, when he was tempted in the desert, you know, he withstood um, the devil's temptations, and Jesus had, um, you know, won. He was in need, though. He was hungry. He hadn't eaten anything for, for 40 days. He had was depleted um, in his humanity. He, he was strengthened in his divinity, but his body, his humanity was depleted. And it, scripture says angels came and ministered to him. Um, angels were present at the giving of the law when the Ten Commandments were given. They, they were there. It wasn't just Moses up on that mountain. Angels were present also. And so this morning, we're going to look at these these angels and seeing the unseen, being able to see the unseen. Uh, This morning's message, um, I hope that you'll really appreciate God's care uh, over your life, that you'll really understand just how involved he is and how much he cares about your your life. Um, You know, when we're in trouble, uh, when we when somebody tries to hurt us or breaks into our house, uh, we are told to call nine one one, right? Well, um, I would encourage you to recall Psalm ninety one one. So nine one one, Psalm ninety one one, top of your outline says this: He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. There's comfort in that. And if you dial Psalm 9111, just go down to Psalm 9111, you will notice what God often uses to shelter us. It says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. One of the ways that God shelters us is by dispatching angels to protect us. So we're going to look at three facts about angels today. The first point has already been made uh, for us. But let's look at um, these these, uh, points together. Number one, angels answer to God, not to us. So that's important to understand as you understand angels, to understand that angels answer to God not us. Psalm 91, 11, again, says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. 
notice there who does the ordering, who does the commanding. Uh, we do not command angels. Uh, we do not call on angels um, to do our bidding. Angels are on mission uh, from Almighty God. They, they answer to God. They don't answer to us. God's the one that provides the angels. And now, I don't know for certain that I have seen an angel like Linda did, but I know with absolute certainty that they see me and that they protect me. I know that for a fact. There are angels, think about this, there are angels in this room right now. They are all around us. They are peering in. They are peeking in on our lives. We are amid, in the midst of, a spiritual realm. Understand something. The space between the physical and the spiritual is minuscule. The gap that separates the earthly from what the, the earthly world from the spiritual world is tissue paper thin. The spiritual world is more real than anything you see. The fact that, that we don't see uh, spiritual realities doesn't lessen their reality. What is unseen, what will last for an eternity. What is seen, what we're seeing is passing away. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 18. It says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So I'm going to ask you today to fix your eyes, to look real intently at the unseen to look in your life and to appreciate and understand the unseen in your life. Oh, that we, you know, could see the protection that surrounds us. I, I can't not share this verse from 2 Kings 6, 15 through 17. It's classic. I preached from it not too long ago, but listen to this. It says, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And then look at verse 16. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Though we, those, are with, those who are with us are much more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha could see the unseen, but he asked God to help this guy, this servant who was afraid, who all he saw was the enemy, the ones that were coming against him, for him to be able to see what Elisha could see. And so that's what I'm asking God to do for you today, for you to be able to see the unseen, for your life to be so centered on God that you can see and believe that he's got you and that he's going to protect you and that you have angels all around you. God sent those angels, and he sends angels to help you too. Hebrews 1.14 says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to those who sent to those who will inherit salvation? Now that's interesting. Also, um, here's a question that gets asked. Do we have guardian angels? Do we have uh, our own? Does God give us our own? God does use angels to guard us. Um, that's a given. Scripture says God uses angels to guard us. But do we have our own? You know, if you could, do I have a Hank <laughs> standing right here? You know, is it? Do I have my own angel? protecting me. 
Well, there's one verse that gives a hint that maybe that's true. Uh, Jesus talked about personal angels in the context of taking care of kids. And he said that in Matthew 18, verse 10. Look at this verse. Jesus said, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. And then he says, For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now that's significant. First of all, for who said it? (laughs) Jesus said it, and he would know. Um, but it's the only verse, that's just one verse. Um, is one verse enough to kind of hang your theological hat on, you know, to hang a, a belief system on? Well, <clears throat> Billy Graham didn't have a problem uh, with it. When he looked at Matthew eighteen ten, he was encouraged by it. He said that, you know, guardianship, possibly begins at infancy, is the way he looked at it. That you might just, your guardian angel might just get get given to you when you are first born. And here is what most uh, Christians do know, that we can name times in our life where there was something that happened, where we were protected that is just not coincidental. Um, there have been times when we were miraculously preserved uh, in times of danger. Uh, We may not have our own angel named uh, Hank, but uh, few of us can explain away some of the tragedies that were averted. Uh, Amen to that, right? I mean, we've had some things happen uh, to protect us and You know, thanks, Hank, if that was you, right? I I honestly don't think any of us can truly comprehend the amount of angelic activity going on around us. Angels are watching over us all the time. Um, They're caring for us all the time because why? God watches over us all the time. God cares about us all the time, and he is the one who is superintendent over the angels, and he's the one that dispatches them whenever he wants to. So God's always taking care of his kids. We're his kids, and uh, I don't know, you know, who your guardian angel is, um, but if God's got one for you, he's taking care of you. Now, I do know uh, who your guardian angel is not, right? Right? I don't know who your guardian angel is, but I can tell you who your guardian angel is not. It is not someone that you lost here. That's the truth. Our loved ones don't become angels when they die. That's not scriptural. Um, Your grandmother or your friend or other family member is not your guardian angel. It, It doesn't matter what... Hollywood says, right? It doesn't matter what is shown on the big screen. An angel doesn't get its wings when the bell rings. It's not, that's not true. And your grandma isn't sporting wings, and she's not playing a harp either. Um, Your grandmother, listen, this is important. A lot of people get this wrong, but it's the truth. Your grandmother was created in God's image, not an angel's image. And that's important. Genesis 127. Uh, Luke McKinnon uh, preached from this a few weeks ago. Um, Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. Uh, In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Angels marvel. Think about this. They marvel at the relationship we have with God. They, They long for that. They they are marvel. They marvel at what you have in God. First Peter 1 uh, 12 says, The things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. I mean, they would love to be able to comprehend this kind of a personal relationship with Almighty God that you and I are allowed to have. 
Now, in due time, uh, we won't get wings, but we will have these bodies of ours transformed into bodies like the Lord Jesus. Listen to Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. He didn't have wings, and we won't either. Uh, Angels never were, nor will they ever be human. None of us are angels. There's not, I'm not an angel, um, and will never be one, and neither will you. It's important to understand that. Uh, number two, angels are mighty warriors of God, not chubby little cherubs. <laughs> They're mighty warriors of God. You know, some people uh, like angels because they view angels as kinder, gentler versions of God or divinity kind of things. I read this. This is kind of interesting to me. More people believe in angels than believe in God. Isn't that interesting? About 80% of people say they believe in angels. Uh, about 60% believe in God, and they, when the God is used loosely. But more pe- 20% more people believe in angels. They're good with angels, not so good with God. People welcome angels because they seem palatable, more manageable. Um, the caricatures uh, that we've created uh, don't help much, right? That we've created gentler, softer angels. Here's the classic picture of a cherub. Uh, There they are. They can't hurt you. Cute. Look at this one. (laughs) You're like, I don't want Hank. I want her, right? What about this one? (laughs) That guy is not going to help you do anything, right? Yeah, he's the uh, angel of um, buffets, is what he, uh, but <laughs> a chubby baby being with wings <laughs> is uh, much more palatable than holy creatures, so awe-inspiring, um, so amazing, that when they appear in Scripture, Every single time they appear in Scripture, the people who see them fall down in fear. (laughs) That's the truth. Matthew 28, 1 through 4. Listen to this. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. That's the angel who rolled away Jesus' stone. And by the way, he didn't roll away the stone so Jesus could get out. He rolled away the stone so they could get in and see that he wasn't there. However, look at Hebrews 1.14 again. And this time focus on the last half of it. Hebrews 1.14 says, We are not all angels, or are not all angels ministering spirits sent to those who will inherit salvation. Again, who's in charge of the angels? God, right? To whom does he dispatch his angels to help? His kids. Those who will inherit salvation. Those who are believers. The promise of um, ministering angels is not for everyone and just anyone. Um, 
I read this this week. New Age gurus today, new, they s- claim they can summon Michael, the archangel. Um, they don't want to do that. Um, in actuality, and this ought to frighten uh, the haphazard, but, but most of the time in Scripture, when angels interact with unbelievers, it's in a negative way. Um, as in the book of Revelation, when they pour out the bowls of wrath, or in the Garden of Eden after the fall, um, standing in the uh, entrance of the garden uh, as Adam and Eve are exiting. You're not allowed to come back in. I mean, that's the thing that you see. Angels are not something you, you want to see if you don't love God or believe in God. Um, think twice. For instance, I don't know if you know this, but think twice before you buy the ticket to go see uh, Tyler Henry, the Hollywood medium who is coming to town um, this July. He's coming. People are buying tickets. Uh, don't be deceived. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. You think you're talking to an angel, but you're not. Let's look at some types of angels. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is the the, the major ones. First one is uh, what I'm just calling the angelic host. Angelic host. These uh, these could just be called uh, common angels. Just your your typical angels in Scripture. <laughs> um, nothing typical about them. Nothing common about them, but they're the ones most often mentioned. They are guardians of people, and in all things physical, um, um, all things, um, they're they're the most common type of angels. These angels are sent um, as messengers uh, to humanity, um, personal guardian angels um, would be in this category of angels, Uh, angels that protect Angels that help you when you've been when you're lost in the woods. These are the, these type of angels. Um, they warn humans and act as warriors on behalf of God. That's the angelic host. And then you've got your cherubim. Number two, your cherubim. These are known for their power and their beauty. Um. There, you read about those in Genesis 3 and Ezekiel, mostly Ezekiel. In Scripture, the cherubim are mentioned more than any other kind of angel, um, specifically, in 91 times. Um, But the only time they are described, what they look like, is in Ezekiel. Uh, They have wings, uh, four faces, uh, a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. They are not toddlers. <laughs> um, and also, they are either carrying God around on a throne or protecting Edom, Eden with a flaming sword. They are certainly not uh, Gerber babies in need of a haircut, right? They are not <laughs> chubby babies. Cherubim are not that. Uh, number three, uh, seraphim. These are known to perform priestly duties. Uh, You read about them in Isaiah 6. That's a powerful passage of Scripture. They're flying around, and and, uh, he sees all this, you know, the train of God's robe fills the temple, and he's like, the year that King Uzziah died, the glory of God was everywhere, and these angels are flying around, and uh, it's just a powerful story there. And then number four, the archangels. Uh, there are two of, named, only two in Scripture, Michael and Gabriel. Michael and Gabriel. Michael, you read about him in, in uh, the New Testament and in Daniel. And, um, 
Then Gabriel, you read about him in Luke. Uh, he's the one that gets to bring uh, news to like Mary and Joseph. Um, interesting here, the book of Enoch, uh, which is an ancient Jewish text, not considered to be scripture in the Protestant um, Bible, names four other angels, um, archangels. So that was interesting to me, uh, one of which is named Raphael, uh, who is uh, also a ninja turtle. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll be here all day. Number five, <laughs> fallen angels. These are uh, Lucifer, uh, the devil, and uh, his demons. Uh, Ezekiel uh, 28 talks about him, Isaiah 14. Uh, those are the passages that speak of his fall. Matthew, uh, obviously, he's Matthew, Luke, Second Peter, Ephesians, uh, James 4, 7, Jude 1, 6, Revelation 12, 10. Uh, demons are talked about in Revelation 12, 4. Um, basically, give it to you in a nutshell, the third, a third of the angels um, went with Lucifer. Lucifer rebelled against God, and a third of the demons uh, angels at the time went with him. When Satan uh, fell, he, uh, he didn't fall alone. Scripture tells us that he took this third of the angels um, that uh, considered, uh, you know, they were part of the angelic host of God. And um, the think about this, the number, <clears throat> Scripture doesn't tell us how many angels there are, but it talks about 10,000 times 10,000. Um, that's, you know, a sizable group. Uh, that's a lot of evil in this world. So think of that, you know, a third of the angels uh, fell with him. So a third of the angels became demons. Um, but the good news is uh, two-thirds didn't. And uh, w- that means we outnumber him two to one. So rest assured, the, you know, the bottom line is that angels and demons... Um, and humans are all created. Um, none of us, uh, none of us are all that. Um, God is all powerful. And as soon as he's done with this creation of his um, squabbling, he will sit us all down. Uh, Philippians 2.10, uh, 2.10 and 11 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee, should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's going to happen one of these days. Last one, number three. Angels are worshipers of God, not recipients of worship. Uh, Listen to how John describes uh, the angelic worship in heaven. I just think this is so beautiful. Uh, Revelation 5, 11 through 14. says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. To, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Imagine hearing tens upon tens of thousands worshiping God. Revelation 7, 11 through 12 says, All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne and worship God saying, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Angels, um, angels are worshipers of God, not recipients of worship. Angels uh, have a free will. Um, They choose uh, to worship Almighty God. Lucifer and his demons um, chose not to worship God. They wanted 
to be worshipped, and they pay dearly for that. They are no longer angels. Their angel status removed from them. But angels um, choose today to worship God. You know, and to our perspective, angels may, you know, be awesome and appear holier than than anything, or are holier than anything we've ever seen personally. But they're not Jesus. They're not. They didn't die for you. Um, they they don't deserve our worship. And this was interesting to me. But in the last chapter of his book of Revelation, John tells us that he tried to worship the angel that was his tour guide. Uh, the one that showed him around, and it didn't go well. Um, look at Revelation 22, 8 and 9. He says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And, and when I heard and, and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. Listen to this. But he said to me, don't do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and all who keep the words of this book. Worship God. I love that so much. Smart angels and smart people are never about themselves. They always point people to Jesus. Wise are the ones that point others to God. It's, it's fun, folks, it's fun to wonder about angels, but never worship them. Never give them more attention than you would give God in your life. It's fascinating to know about them, to look forward to meeting them, but it's equally important to understand that you'll never be one of them. Um, you know why? God's got bigger plans for you than that. God's got big plans for you. I'm going to end with a story from Arthur Blessed. Arthur Blessed was a guy who carried a cross in, uh, all over the world, and he would share the gospel everywhere he went. And he has some fascinating stories. You can read a lot of stories online about him, but this is a story in war-torn Nicaragua that happened to him. And he talks about being, he crossed the Pan-American Highway of South Leon, and uh, he arrived there. He, he was traveling, and this was his custom. He traveled, and he arrived. Uh, he was driving. He had a, a kind of a, it was a four-wheel drive vehicle pulling a small trailer, like a camper trailer. And uh, he had a couple guys, the guy that's normally with him, and then another guy that actually took his vacation time to be with him and to help translate for him and also to teach Arthur Spanish. And um, they, when they got to this area, um, this is a worn, torn area. It's just terrible area. But they were told not to stay the night where they're at. Don't be on this road tonight. Um, it's just extremely dangerous. The the Sandinista guerrilla movement was in its revolt, highest revolt, and it was just they said don't don't do it. And um, but Arthur has a. Thing, he uh, stays wherever his cross stops. That's always been his policy, and he told them, he says, you know, I sleep where the cross stops. And uh, one man that they were, was there with him gave the sign of the cross, and, you know, they, they just didn't recommend it. But he's like, that's it. And they ate a little bit of food and all climbed into bed. He said he was just exhausted. And he said that night <clears throat> uh, he heard something outside, and, opened the little, you know, curtain thing, and there was a gun in his face. And the, uh, was, they announced themselves as the police, but he realized they weren't the police. And he opened the door, and they just rushed into that little camper and uh, started looking around. And uh, all those guys obviously were, were frightened about it. They had guns and pointing at him, he said. And one short, middle-aged guy put a pistol directly in his face and pushed him back and and made him sit down and all these different things. And all the assailants were, he said, dressed in khakis and looked like they were going to, um, you know, they weren't going to make it through the night. Um, he said they were there. And he goes, I, they lined up. They uh, lined me up. They took me outside. The other guys are still in their bed. And they took me outside and they pushed me up against the, the camper. And uh, 
they all lined up about 15 feet away with their guns drawn and uh, pointed them at me. And he said, I realized I was a, gonna, they're going to shoot me. I'm gonna, there's a firing squad. They're going to kill me. And um, the cross, he said, was on top of the, of the camper, or on top of the truck, rather. And uh, he said, but it flashed through my mind. He goes, you know, I'm going to die, but I'm not going to die without my Bible. And uh, he said that all these guns were aimed at me, but I quickly turned to the right because I knew just inside the, the door there was a box with some Bibles in it. So he reached into that box, but the box he grabbed was, already, was shut. You need a knife to open it. Um, but, you know, he grabbed it anyway, and he swung that door open, and they were arguing with him. They're like, don't, you know, don't do that. Don't open that. And uh, he's like, you can shoot me, but I'm not going to die without my Bible, man. And he's like, you know, you can shoot me. They shoot me in the front, and they shoot me in the back, but I'm, gonna, I'm going for this Bible before, um, you know, I'm not going down without a Bible. And uh, he goes, I don't know what happened, but all the gunmen were suddenly on the ground. Uh, flat on their backs. And he said that the short man who seemed to be the leader was lying inside the trailer with only his legs sticking out. And as I walked toward them, they slowly got uh, up in a daze. The short man uh, sat at the door of the trailer, collected himself. (laughs) And I asked him if he wanted a Bible. And he he said, we won't bother you we won't bother you. Um, and uh, I just stood in silence, and they, they left. He says, I walked into the trailer, and Don said, we thought you were dead. Uh, they were going to shoot me, I said, but I looked. Uh, you know, I opened the truck, and I got some Bibles, and when I looked up, all the men were on the ground. And then the guy said, Arthur, he said, we could hear the blows of meat against meat. We thought they were killing you. And then we heard them cry out, and then they fell backward. One of the men flew into the doorway. They said, we saw a bright light. God was there, and the gunman fell to the ground. That same night, in Phoenix, Arizona, friends of Arthur's were in bed about ready to drift off to sleep, and suddenly Jan had a vision. The ceiling of the room lit up with his face, she said, Arthur's face. The vision she saw was me about to die. She grabbed her husband, Paul, and said, Paul, pray. Pray. Arthur is about to die. She had been reading Billy Graham's book, Angels. And she prayed in her own special way, in her beautiful way, Lord, send 12 big angels down right now and deliver Arthur. Soon they felt peace, and Jan said, Arthur's okay now. And he was. Let's pray together. Father, I love you, and I thank you for loving us and protecting us, and I pray that we would see with eyes wide open your care over us. Thank you for protecting us when we're lost, saving us when we're lost. And I just pray, God, we would trust you with our lives. And thank you, God, for protecting um, our eternities by sending your son Jesus to die on a cross that if we'll accept him, we can be your children. And being your children comes with protection that we desperately need in this world. And I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as Lord, today would be their day. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. If you'd like to pray with me, I'll be here.